Welcome to Conversations on the Coast, the Bay Area's premier author interview program. The title of the book today is really going to please you all. Somebody, the, the reckless life and remarkable career of one Marlon Brando. The author, Stefan Kanfer, is with us, and the publisher is Alfred A. Knopf. Thanks for coming by. It's my pleasure. I don't usually read with too much attention or focus what publishers send me, but there's a line in your publisher's letter which says uh, about this book that you seamlessly intertwine the man and the work. And, you know, that's not puffery. You really do this. That's and and I, I, I think it, it makes the book right off the bat remarkable. That's very kind of you. Thank you. When you talk about, for example, Marlon going to New York in the 40s, mm-hmm. you know, and you give us that whole, the war is almost overseen. Mm-hmm. And when you talk about what's happening to him in the 50s, you let us know the, 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 the tenor of the country. Uh, the the HUAC thing is going on, mm-hmm. and and so forth. And then you tell us all that's happening on Broadway and or in the movies, depending upon where you're at. Well, more than almost any other actor, I think, maybe alone, uh, Marlon reflects his era in various ways, both when he's doing Tennessee Williams, which is a tremendous breakthrough talent at that point, you know, on uh, Streetcar and Stanley Kowalski and all that. And then later on when he was working – for Kazan, who gave names to the House of American Activities Committee. And so Waterfront on the Waterfront is really kind of a metaphor for giving names. It's okay. You remember uh-huh. that? Yeah. Marlon Brando yeah. gives names to the Waterfront yeah. Commission, and that's okay. So there's an excuse for it. Bud Schilberg wrote it. He furnished names to the HUAC. So there's all kinds of echolalia that are about this that I felt had to be said. Another way that you uh, intertwine, if you don't mind my using that word again, you, you you do some intertwining as you go around the country now and promote this marvelous book. Thank you. You're, you're, you're not only carrying a book under your arm, you also got some film. I think it's important to look at this artist. For one thing, he changed the art form of cinema acting. I mean, before him, there were good-looking people like Tyrone Power, and there were really very good actors like Spencer Tracy, a wonderful actor, but those people were protecting themselves. Marlon went out there naked. And that's a very different kind of performer. Um, it often made a fool of himself. But when you see something like uh, Waterfront, mm-hmm. which is an original, not not a, a stage adaptation, the way Streetcar was, and you see him expose himself in that way and often would not remember his lines deliberately because he believed that it's kind of like you are and I are now. We, we don't know our lines. We're just going to talk. And that kind of emotional truth that he established in there often – I think it was very wounding. It was uh, He's a wounded soul, and you can see it in the performance of Terry Malloy. So I wanted to show people that movie so they would see it. So it wasn't just talk about somebody. You could actually see this man performing without a skin uh, on uh, the big screen. The way you sum that up, uh, the relationship between private, <clears throat> private life and movie roles, the marvelous sentence, they were one and the same, you write, complicated, dangerous, vulnerable. Yes, I think he, because he came from a family of alcoholics, uh, and his father told him he would always be worthless no matter what he did, he believed his father. I mean, he said he didn't, and he hated his father, but his father wrecked his life emotionally. And I think if there's a rosebud to Marlon Brando's life, it's that he was mentally ill all, all for the all 80 years. Mm-hmm. And the miracle is not that he made so many lousy films, and he did, but that he made so many great ones that have simply become part of the American canon. You can't imagine American cinema without Marlon Brando because of all the influence he had on um, people like De Niro and Pacino and James Caan and Johnny Depp, etc. You can just look at the, the generations that follow are tumbling out of uh, Brando's leather jacket. It's, it's really uh, a remarkable achievement, even with all of the bad films. And that upbringing mm-hmm. that you, you know, detail mm-hmm. as you go along, um, it drives me crazy And I'll tell you why, because I I guess you would agree that it's the upbringing that makes it impossible for him ever to enjoy success. Well, it's true. uh, There's a sentence in there when I say he's like a figure out of a folklore tale because he could have all the women he wanted, all the money he wanted, all the fame as long as he didn't enjoy it. And that is the truth. He never did enjoy it. And I think 
felt somehow it was a con. He was putting it over on the public and doing a pretty good job of it. The level of, of praise that he would get that, that he couldn't, if you will, revel in. I Never. mean, it's, it's absolutely sickening. You, 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 you quote from reviews for the streetcar. Mm-hmm. Oh, my God. You know, any actor would, would, would kill three times for that guy. Yes, it's a heartbreak. The whole thing is, I believe that his life was a tragedy because of that, that he was not able to enjoy a second of it. And none of his friends were allowed to talk about acting. They could talk about politics or anything else, but not that. Yeah, he always felt that the acclaim that he was getting could possibly be bogus. I think he felt it every step of the way. Oh, well, somebody tells us the full story of a most amazing life, a life full of phenomenal early success, and we'll look at some more of that early success when we return. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster, C-O-C, at gmail.com. Somebody, the reckless life and remarkable career of Marlon Brando. That's the title of the book. The author, Stefan Kanfer, is with us. And a gentleman by the name you've all heard of, Peter Bogdanovich, has this to say about the book. Stefan Kanfer has written a compassionate yet clear-eyed and vivid chronicle of the most influential actor of the 20th century. I have a feeling you would never be tempted to write anything that wasn't clear-eyed. I think that's probably uh, really, the case. Yeah, yes. yeah, okay. <laughs> I mean, I, I'm I don't glad wear he patches, says that. But, I don't wear patches over my eyes. Yeah, no. okay. A rebellious and deeply conflicted man, tortured by the fame and success he achieved, and we've been talking about that. Marlon Brando's story is a fascinating and tragic one, and Canfer gives it the size and understanding necessary to provide an enthralling read. And I think he's right about that. Thank I you. think he's right about that. Now, we, we've already talked about this negative reaction to success that he's had. And and he had, in addition to the success in uh, in, in Streetcar, he had other early successes mm-hmm. on, on Broadway. One of the earlier ones was uh, Ben Hex, A Flag is Born. This is an interesting play about the birth of Israel and the Holocaust. Yes. You would not uh, quickly associate in your mind Marlon Brando with Zionism, but his acting teacher was the great Stella Adler, and she was from a Yiddish theater family. Her father was Jacob Adler, the previous And you, you do a great job on setting that up, you know, the whole Yiddish uh, theater and the influence it had, not just on, on Marlon, but on other actors. Well, I wrote that. a book about the Yiddish theater a couple yeah. of years ago, and my grandfather was a producer in the Yiddish theater, so it's familiar to me. And Stella was a great acting teacher of her generation. But in that class, and it was a pretty well-known class for people like uh, Harry Belafonte and Shelley Winters and Elaine Stritch, and Elaine Stritch is still around and is a friend of mine, and she uh, mm-hmm. she said that sending Marlon to acting school is like sending a tiger to jungle school. You know, he <laughs> knew it already. He knew it. But he was introduced, this Omaha kid, and then later, uh, you know, in the in the rural parts of Illinois, comes to New York and he's suddenly introduced to this sophisticated Jewish stratum of of uh, of New York life, and so he became enraptured. He became sort of a an honorary Jew. And when they opted for Zionism, he was right in with them. He was all for it, and he was in a, that play, which was written by Ben Hecht. And really, he was so valid as as a Jew, which of course he was not, <laughs> that he caused women to weep and scream and. Ask, you know, where were you when uh, the ovens were burning in Auschwitz? He was so taken by this, by his own power. Paul Muni was in it, and he said, how could a kid like that from Omaha act like that, like a Jew? He couldn't believe that it was happening. (laughs) That's how good he was. There it was. They were wailing in the theater almost Mm -hmm. every day. It it seems like very, very quickly he he, he moved on to uh, movies. He did. I, I think that he was really afraid of boredom and probably afraid of the theater. He, he tried to get out of his streetcar contract after about Yeah, that's amazing. And, 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 and his reason was he got bored saying the same stuff every night, well, well, Jessica, which was a lie. Yes. Well, Jessica Tandy was with him, and, and she was the Blanche, the original Blanche Dubois, and said he is an 
impossible psychopathic bastard. She said that was his idea. <laughs> and her and husband that was a compliment. Yes, her husband Hume Cronin said, "Yes, he is, but you're going to learn from him." And she did. <laughs> and I think the fact is that he just felt after a while he could not keep repeating these lines, and he was looking for another art form. And of course, he found it in cinema because yes, you have to reproduce your lines again and again for takes, but then it's over. The film yeah, wraps yeah. and go on. To the you next go home. One. Yes, and that was important to him. And one of the first films, if not the first one, was The Men. The Men, that's the first, yes. And in that, he plays a paraplegic. And what's interesting about that is a war veteran who, because he has no feeling below his waist, has no sex life. But at the same time, he's a man. How do you do this on screen? He was the first actor to go and live with these guys in a ward and see how they thought and what their wise guys isms were and how they worked with a wheelchair, and how they ate and how they talked to each other and their relationships with women and all that was extremely painful for him, but he made us feel the pain in a way that other actors could never have done because they wouldn't have lived with these guys that long. And there's a wonderful story when he is with them in a bar. They always hung out at a bar. And a born-again woman comes in and says, I can get you to walk again. He says, yes, I, I can feel it. I can feel it. And he sort of limply gets out of the chair and he goes a little And then all of a sudden he begins <laughs> dancing on the bar. She went out of there screaming. <laughs> she got what she wanted. Yes, she got what she deserved. Let's put it that way. <laughs> Good Lord. The next film was uh, Viva Zapata. Viva Zapata is interesting. It's in, so both of those are interesting movies. Viva Zapata, he plays a Mexican revolutionary with the makeup and all that, with a slight Spanish intonation, a very good movie, very overlooked. And, of course, then you have Julius Caesar, in which this guy who thought everyone thought was a mumbler turned out to speak perfectly good Shakespearean. He can do it all. He could. He can be a Jew. He could be a Shakespearean. Mark Anthony, yes. Oh, Anthony. my gosh. Ah, listen, there's so much more in somebody. We need to talk about stuff like The Godfather. You better stay tuned. You're listening to Conversations on the Coast with Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster, COC at gmail.com. This is Conversations on the Coast. I'm Jim Foster. The book we're talking about today is Somebody, The Reckless Life and Remarkable Career of Marlon Brando. The author, the, the charming, so well informed Stephen Cantfer, is with us today. And uh, a gentleman who lives right here in the Bay Area, David Thompson. He sent some nice words over to you, Stephen. Stephen Cantor has done a miraculous job in conveying the reckless, untidy, oh wow, and darkening life in a manageable space and with refreshing clarity. There will be more Brando books because our fascination does not die. But somebody is a landmark in Brando studies, fair, accurate, and admiring, but never far from tragic. I couldn't agree more. I couldn't agree more. I find it a, a difficult book to sum up, but I'm pleased to report that I think you sum it up very well at the end, and I, uh, toward the end of the book. And I'd like you to share with us your thoughts at All the right. end. I'll quote from the book. Marlon's estate has long since been evaluated, fought over, and dispersed. But he left two bequests that lie beyond the reach of his heirs and assigns. The first is to the public. Five of his early films are indisputable classics of black and white cinema. The Men, A Streetcar Named Desire, Viva Zapata, Julius Caesar, and On the Waterfront. The Wild One has made its own place in popular culture. Between those astonishing features and The Godfather, there is a widely and incorrectly supposed to be a desert with only a handful of oases. Marlon took a lot of significant roles between his debut as Ken Wilczek in 1950, and the Vito Corleone of 1972. Sky Masterson, Major Groover, Snakeskin Xavier, Rio, Fletcher Christian, Robert Crane, Mayor Weldon Penderton, Sir William Walker, and Peter Quint are memorable figures that no one else could have played with such convincing passion. Post-Godfather came such indelible personae as Paul of Last Tango in Paris, 
Robert E. Lee Clayton of the Missouri Breaks, Colonel Walter E. Kurtz of Apocalypse Now, and Ian McKenzie of A Dry White Season. These creations have aged well, even if the motion pictures themselves show the erosions of time. The second bequest is to the acting community. John Saxon recalls the first time he saw Brando. The Oscars had recently been given out for Waterfront, and Marlon was a bit wary as he parked near Schwab's Drugstore on Sunset Boulevard, a famous hangout for show folk. He had reason to smile a minute later. The 30-year-old, quote, emerged from his car, says Saxon, and I remember an actor saying, Marlon, you did it for us. These were not the Tyrone Power kind of good-looking people. You did it for us meant you gave us an opportunity to be somebody, a break in the system. As things turned out, it was more than a break. It was a complete severance. The opportunity to be somebody, in Saxon's phrase, mirrored Terry Malloy's famous protest and on the waterfront. I could have had class. I could have been somebody. By taking chances, by jumping without a net, in film after film for more than 50 years, Marlon Brando rewrote the conventions of screen acting. In the process, he helped to make somebodies out of performers who in previous times would have had to settle for character parts if they worked at all. There can be no doubt of James Kahn's observation made after his hero had passed away. Quote, anyone of my generation who says he hasn't done Brando is lying. And I think that posits Brando exactly where you believe he should be. Yes, I think that it's uh, a necessary acknowledgement to a man whose shadow still falls across the screen. There's many times in this book where you'll be talking about a success or a failure in a film or a play, and then you'll say, in the meantime, or at the same time, the personal life was, and it's usually blah. It's almost always terrible. He had three wives, none of whom really worked out, and I think none of whom he really loved. He had 11 children. When the kids were young, he knew how to handle them. When they got to be adolescents, he didn't. As as you know, his son... That's never happened to anybody else. Well, his son, <laughs> what never happened to anybody else, his son killed uh, his sister's yeah. lover. Yeah. She later hanged himself, and Christian Brand only died a couple of months ago of, one of his friends said, of too much living. It was a really tragic family. There was a woman in that mix that he had a continuing relationship with, at least that's the way I read it, one Ellen Adler. Ellen Adler was the daughter, is the daughter, of Stella Adler. She's still around. Uh -huh. And their agreement was they would talk about anything else except acting. She could talk about politics. She could talk about her dress. She could talk about his shoes. But they could never talk about acting. And that's why they remained friends for 50 years. He just couldn't bear the idea that he was great. What a marvelous idea. What a marvelous idea. I'm never talking? Yes. You yeah. mean about yourself? Well, you know, because to talk about it was to put him into that ambivalent you know, crazy place, in mm -hmm. my opinion, where he couldn't accept praise and would, of course, be upset by negative uh, your, your impression is correct. And and so there she was. Should have married her. No, you're right. I don't know. Somebody, The Reckless Life and Remarkable Career of Marlon Brando by Stephen Canfer. It's a book you should get and read, and if you do that, you'll long remember it. This has been Conversations on the Coast, and I'm Jim Foster. Now you can find this program on iTunes, SoundCloud, and all your favorite digital outlets. Follow the show on Twitter at Jim Foster COC and email Jim Foster COC at gmail.com.